Hello and welcome to The Last Andy, a board game podcast coming to you from three exciting countries across Europe. I'm here, joined here today by Audrey. Hi everyone! By Alessio. Hello! And I will be your host, Alexis. Audrey today will talk to us about MLEM, Space Agency, and Alessio will discuss the game Rebel Princess, while I'll talk about Serious Pulp's Seven Citadel. Um, but first, we'll start by seeing how everyone is doing with the standy catch-up. So how have you been doing, Audrey? Uh, I've been doing fine, honestly, playing a bit of uh, board games, enjoying the French discount on all the expansions of Everdell. 50% off, amazing, I got everything, <laughs> now I need to find a box. Uh, <laughs> this weekend will be the uh, little convention of my board and role-playing uh, games club, uh, where I will be hosting uh, the afternoon um, a painting, um, how is it in English, um, class for beginners? Uh, a painting class yeah. for beginners. Uh, but I wanted to yeah. say initiation, which is a French uh, word uh, initially. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I will be doing that uh, in the afternoon and on the evening I will be helping my husband um, uh, coordinate, let's say, a multi table of role playing games uh, that is like making all the people work together on a. Um, test, um, something that they have to elucidate, uh, a kind of big ma ma machine that's not working anymore, the machine of life and death, uh, something like that. Um, it looks like it's going to be quite fun, to be honest, uh, and we will see what the uh, players do, and what my painting students do. Uh, other than that, I'm still doing lots of stuff in uh, work, and uh, I have signed my soul again to the devil that a blizzard is. Um, and I'm playing uh, World of Warcraft again, so I don't know exactly what the result is going to be in terms of uh, board gaming time, but as it's not something I usually do in the week uh, evenings, I think that sh should be fine. So, yeah, overall, I think that's all that I have to say for now. And, yeah, what about you, Alessio? Oh, well, uh, this is uh, a good time to begin a rant about Marvel Snap, because uh, I, uh, I played a lot of Marvel Snap lately, and uh, I am a free-to-play player, so I'm usually behind of a couple of months with the paying players and uh, I managed just once to reach infinite rank which is oh. the highest rank uh, yeah it, it, it's actually there is a lot of competition there after you get there and you uh, and uh, I, I actually got pummeled down, I, I think. <laughs> I'm not for the competitive circuits, but anyway, uh, I, I think that infinite rank is uh, really attainable, but the game is beginning to get a lot pay to win, because uh, I noticed with this latest season that the, the, game, the, the meta went stale, and that meant that actually people with uh, older collections could uh, actually play on a fair basis with uh, people with newer collections. So uh, I managed to get to level 96 uh, basically almost immediately in the first week. So I'm trying to get to level 100 and the infinite rank again, but it's a lot of pull, uh, it's a tug of war. Because every week a new card gets pushed and the sun cards are very good and it's a bit of hard. It's a bit of frustrating to have to to lose against paying players, but I understand that that's how economy goes. So uh, I guess it's fair, but that that's my main complaint this week. After that, uh, uh, well. We all know that, uh, I don't know if it's a good time for board gaming news, but a couple of big things uh, happened uh, during the week, which is basically that Asmodee 
has been uh, dismembered from Embracer Group with uh, 900 million debt basic, yeah. basically coming from yeah uh, yeah that's it basically Embracer Group which is the la- latest holder of Asmodee uh, decided to dismember the group in three parts two dedicated to uh, developing video games with a huge depth and Asmodi, which is actually one of the leading companies. It, it's probably a, a very responsible thing to do because when you have two, 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 two companies in a big deficit and the third one, which is actually a leader in the... It's, it's a leader in its own... Uh, in, in its own field, uh, you actually would do it a favor to dismember it but they t- took a loan for the group and uh, gave it exclusively to Asmodi. so Asmodi will start in debt with 900 million dollars debt and this is kind of a big deal yes and uh, it's too bad because uh, I remember four or five years ago when Asmodee was the big publisher who bought, uh, who bought uh, Final, uh, Fantasy Flight and they were the, the big bad who ca- t- bought games and shut, down, shut them down but uh, now they are basically victims and actually I think they played pretty fair in the last couple of years. So it's too bad that they have to endure this. And especially because I was reasoning, because the, the other news is that uh, Lucky Duck Games got sold by the Goliath. Uh, it's both, not sold. both by Goliath Games, yes, exactly. And I was wondering, as uh, a, a publishing company, they had uh, a lot of controversial games, but very interesting. But I think that as distributors of other games, like Asmodee, they did wonders, especially in Europe. I mean, uh, I think I have a lot of games that are in Europe exclusively because uh, Lucky Duck Games distributed them. Yeah. So it's always where things are changing. I, I don't think I have an opinion, but uh, these are the news and they're big news. So that's it. Besides that, I got a new PC because basically the company got a bonus and that was the only way to do not get it taxed a lot. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bought, bought a new PC, so I have a new rig. I, I hope this recording will go well because uh, the setup is completely new. And, uh, oh, I received a reliable wizard from the Kickstarter, finally, from the actually GameFound campaign, from the crowdfunding. Uh, a Reliable Wizard is a solo game in pixel art, exceptionally funny, uh, with customizable spell and the expansion looks, looks, because I didn't play it yet because I am finishing uh, a Reliable because Wizard Because everyone first. buys games that don't play it right away anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> everyone, well, everyone does. But well, for solo game is a bit different because you can always play a solo, especially if it's a thirty-minute game. So, uh, anyway, it's very beautiful. I think I'll talk about it. But one thing at a time. So that's basically it. There are a, cu- a couple crowdfunding news, but I think they will tie with the games we will talk about. So uh, they can wait. So what about you, Alexis? I've been doing all right. Uh, I've been playing a lot of the Seven Citadel, the game I'll talk to, uh, I'll talk about today. Uh, other <laughs> than that, mostly uh, walked recently. Uh, thankfully, we are having some friends over from Sweden um, at the end of the week, so I'm going to have uh, some fun times, just having people around and showing them Belgium. Uh, that is going to be quite nice. And uh, on a slightly unrelated note, uh, I've just finished uh, Yakuza 7, not the latest Yakuza, the one just before that, and I would recommend to anyone interested in the series to start with this one, since it's introduced a new character and it's a kind of a brand new story. I uh, haven't played any in the series, I have no idea what it is, but well, I heard the last one. It is one. 
do a bit of it noise. is a very it is a very fun game about uh yakuza's having weird adventure in uh tokyo yeah um, kind of sandbox kind of story driven it's beautiful series yeah. of game yes yeah, there those, are are, those are great games and they are recently started to um basically restart the story well to start the story uh, the story of a new character and like kind of uh, put aside the the old characters that have been there for i guess 20 years plus since the, the first game so it's like a, a perfect man I, i'm players. old <laughs> for, for anyway. me y- y- yakuza is the, is a new series so <laughs> <laughs> well i've always enjoyed the yakuza game and this one was uh was really great so i would recommend it to anyone uh and also um, since i'm uh in a plugging mood I've recently read the latest book from Stuart Dutton, uh, The Last Man Murder at the End of the World, and it's like a sci-fi murder mystery, post-apocalyptic, uh, weird story uh, that is extremely fun to read. And I would recommend uh, that book or anyone, uh, any other book from Stuart Dutton, who is a great author. Uh, in any case, uh, let's move on to something a little bit more uh, up or alley with Rebel Princess, which is the game that Alessio is going to talk about today, and it is a cult game, if I'm... Uh... Exactly, okay, Rebel Princess. Uh, Rebel Princess is a game from Zombie Paella, which is a Spanish uh, game designing publishing company. They are a small company, and they uh, they do stuff like this, be, uh, but I'll be clear by describing the game. Uh, Rebel Princess is a card game and uh, I could describe it in basically a sentence which is it's hearts with a twist uh, do do you da, di, do anyone uh, did anyone play hearts first before mm, uh, I don't never think I did or yeah, even but... if I did it was under another name for French version and Yeah, th- th- that's because. Uh, uh, but I, 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 again, I'm old, so th- yeah, probably you young guns uh, didn't play it. But uh, Hearts was a game which shipped in, I think, in Windows, starting from Windows XP, uh, and it was one of the games you could play, like Hearts Spider, when they replaced the old Solitaire and Minesweeper. They added hearts and other games. Okay, so uh, I'll describe it to you. Uh, hearts, okay, no, well, we'll start with Rebel Princess, okay, all right. So, Rebel Princess is a card game. In this game, there are the princesses like Snow White, Cinderella, Sherazad, and all the other pr- famous princesses of, of fables uh, who are basically hosting a party. And in this party, they want to have fun. They are young. Uh, they want to do nasty girl stuff. And uh, it's uh, a party where princes are not uh, princes like men, male princes are not allowed because they would arrange proposals and they want to be they actually want to stay free and independent. So uh, in this party, they are basically trying to avoid the princess uh, it's like the game of arts because it plays like a trick taking game so you have a hand of cards and uh, these cards come from different suits which are themed uh, so you have the prince the, the, the suit of queens the suit of pets and the suit of princes and the suit of fairies and uh, you'll play cards from the suit and you have to uh, answer with the same card that is played so you have to follow the leader if i play a fairy card you have to answer with a fairy card and if you don't have a card with the same suit you can play any card Uh, the goal of the game is to avoid the suit of princes because every prince will have a value of 1 to 12 and uh, that will count as negative points They are marriage proposals. You have to uh, avoid proposal, to dodge proposals, so you do- don't want to have the princess. 
And that's basically how the game plays. You have to try to not get the princess at your uh, in your tricks in the trick you take. And uh, you play five rounds. Each round has a special rule, which you draw at random from a set of special events. For instance, there is the beginning, which is the invitation, which is you play normally. Uh, otherwise, you have like a musket ball, you can have a royal decree, you can have the musical chairs and stuff like that, which give uh, some differences. Like, for instance, uh, in a masquerade ball, you play the cards face down and you reveal them after you play it, except the leading suit. So... Uh, the game is actually uh, a lot of dodging the card of hearts. Uh, there is a special card in the suit of pets, which is the frog, which is, of course, if you get it, it gets a prince with a value of eight. Oh, no. So it's a nasty, nasty card. <laughs> yes, exactly. And uh, you play five rounds. At the end of the, f of the five rounds, the one with uh, most points, so... The, the player which scored the least number of uh, proposals wins. Now, uh, that's basically the game, and that's basically it is kind of uh, special rules version of arts. Because in arts, it was a trick-taking game when uh, where you uh, have to dodge the cards of arts, of course, which are valued the negative points. And the, there was the queen of clubs, I think, uh, the, 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 with the names of the of the suits uh, in English, I always have problems. But I think it was the Queen of Clubs, which was valued like uh, minus twenty five points, and that was basically it. Now uh, the problem with arts is, is it, of course, that it was a, play, a game with a lot of randomness, where uh, you couldn't strategize a lot, and the point difference was big. For instance, get, getting minus 25 was unrecoverable, basically. So, uh, what was done right in uh, Rebel Princess is that this is a simple game with a, with a very valid, uh, with a very fun and stable way to play. It, it is a tried and tested uh, game, which is actually uh, around, I think, from 20 years or so, like all the time that Windows XP is around, everyone everyone used to know hearts, of course, not you youngster, I mean. Uh, but uh, they took this game, which is already widespread and popular, and they added the the small set of, rule, of rules, which makes it basically tactical. Because uh, you in, in the game you have a princess, and this princess has a special power. Okay, you can e use it usually once per round or once per game. For instance, uh, Snow White, uh, of course, it comes with the seven dwarfs. Uh, so whenever you play a card with a value of seven or lower, you can make it count as a zero for that round. Or you have, for instance, Cinderella. You know that Cinderella turns back uh, 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 from rich, becomes poor at midnight. So when you play it, when you play its power, it is midnight. And the cards uh, which were valued 12 are valued 1. And the cards which value... So the, the, basically the values are inverted. 12 is the lowest and 1 is the highest. Uh, that way you have a way to subvert the game and make it tactical because you are not just uh, in uh, moved by the, the whatever the other card the other player play or the cards you have in hand you can basically overturn a game a hand a trick which you could uh, which you would lose in a normal game and that's brilliant because basically you take a simple concept add a simple rule and everything changes now the fact that every round has its own special rule it is the added salt to the game uh, it is worth noting that uh, the game has rules to be played in five normal rounds or five or rounds with a story for instance there is a recommended 
order of rounds with the special rules which uh, describe the story like the masquerade ball i mentioned earlier or you can just go for random there is a lot to play in this small box game and actually the game is like uh, 15 euros because basically it's a deck of cards uh, it, makes another... think, it makes me think of love letter a, a little bit yeah uh, well uh, yes yeah, a little bit of that Yes, there, 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 there is a little bit of love letter. Of course, you are working with trick taking, so uh, I mean, that, yeah, that's trick -taking what. Trick taking uh, games with previous yeah. teams. Well. Yeah, exactly. So oh. th 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 that's uh, that's basically it. Uh, uh, it is true that uh, trick taking games have have so have seen a lot of evolution lately. Uh, I mean, uh, there is Brian Boru, the game uh, that borrowed Fan to no end, uh, we, which was a brilliant way of playing trick, trick taking for me, uh, where you basically use the trick taking to get an area majority game, which was unheard of. Uh, there will be arcs in the near future, we which uses trick taking as its main engine and makes a campaign game spanning multiple generations. So uh, it's beautiful to see that uh, a simple trick taking game, taking basically the most the most basic concept of trick taking, uh, can be edited to be a fun challenge for. I, I think uh, it's best it's fa it's for players, but. Like I said, it's a small fun recommendation which can give you an afternoon of play with friends. Like after a long lunch, to, uh, after an holiday or something with the family, you just uh, take out the game and play a few rounds. It's always fun and beautiful and uh, the kind of player interaction when when every player decided to play everything and you get uh, a princess uh, you get a prince uh, with a value of 12 and then you go cinderella so every every value is uh, is uh, overturned and uh, your wife gets uh, the prince and you sleep on the couch is i think uh, <laughs> it's worth it so yeah Rebel Princess, my recommendation. Uh, I don't know if it was very clear, but it's basically a lot of uh, uh, a lot of memories from hearts from playing online for the first times at these games and uh, seeing it in a new board game with new rules. I I can only say good things about the, this game, this small design piece and. I, I also love it that uh, they are Spanish, they published it in, both in uh, actual Spanish, uh, Castilian Spanish and Catalan, I hope it's said uh, like this in English, but it's Castellano and Catalano, so that's it. It's beautiful, like it. And that's it, that's all, actually, it's a... It's a 10 minutes per round game, maybe 5, so what Rebel a, Princess, recommendation. Game. I really like the, uh, how do you call that in English again, uh, Count, uh, inspiration in it, uh, the fairy yeah. tales uh, aspect. Yeah, the, 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 theme, the theme stays there perfect, the, the, the graphical project is beautiful, I think that uh, when you go with princesses, you think of Disney princesses, and most of them are actually in Disney stories. So you are usually, uh, you always think of, of the graphical design that Disney went with them. They... But, but the, the graphics in this game are so beautiful and captivating and charming that actually they make you forget about the... The Disney rendition. It it's is beautiful very in song. They even yeah. have um, uh, Alice in Wonderland, who is not a princess, but is a Disney yeah. character, which <laughs> I guess is why they chose it. And a uh, nice little illustration of the uh, Cheshire cat. Speaking of cat, uh, yeah. <laughs> Audrey today is going to talk about a space agency that somehow decided to make all of the astronauts cats. Um, it seems like a terrible idea, but... It's the future! Uh, 
<laughs> but the game plays uh, extremely well. I've uh, had a, gra a grand time playing it with Audrey. Uh, last time I was at her place. Yes! Blam! Space Agency! So, yeah, what happens if you send cats in space? Uh, lots of mess happens, uh, let me tell you. So, uh, this is, I think it is my first uh, Rainier Kinesia uh, game that I have. Not that I have played, I'm not sure exactly, but I think it's the first that I actually own. Uh, so, this is a game about, as we said, sending cats uh, in space in a shuttle. So the, it's a dice game mostly, uh, where people will uh, toss dice and use the dice to progress in space. And um, there is an element of push your luck. Actually, this is my first uh, push your luck game, so that was something uh, I discovered and I really enjoyed. So first off, let's talk about the game components because these are still the first thing <laughs> that we notice when we get a game. The box, it has, I'm not, I'm not sure it's a linen finish, but it has a very, very soft uh, cover, and I really enjoyed that. Uh, inside, there are quite a few tokens, um, a shuttle, of course, uh, and a big neoprene mat, uh, which is actually the, the board. And I was impressed because the game is less than 50 euros, and um, having a neoprene mat, which is not small, it's more than 50 centimeters long and something like 25, 30 uh, wide. So that's an impressive uh, neoprene mat. And uh, a few dice, uh, I think it's six. Yes, six. Um, and that's it, that's all the components that the game has. And I, w I was quite impressed, honestly. Uh, there is also a mini insert, which basically says that the play mat goes this side and of the other components uh, go on this side. So now the way the game plays, so each player will select a color of cat, which doesn't really bring anything to the game. There is absolutely no asymmetrical uh, element. Um, and they get a cat agency, let's call it that way, board, where they put all of their astronaut cats. So I think it's eight per player. Let me check, yes, 8 per player, and they all have a special capacity, which is just like a design on the cat, so that makes it very easy to play with uh, multilingual friends. Uh, they can get uh, a PDF uh, somewhere and then just play, because everything else is uh, similar. And uh, so there will be a leader of the shuttle, so that player will say, oh, I'm going to put this cat uh, in the shuttle, and they will take the token of one of their cats and put it in the shuttle at the top. There are slots, and yeah. Uh, then it will go round the table, and every player in turn will put a cat in a shuttle, and they will select uh, which one. So depending on their ability, on what they want to achieve, etc., etc. And uh, then the first player, which is the leader as long as uh, their cat stays first in the shuttle, which generally ends up being stays in the shuttle, um, they will toss the dice repetitively and see on the board where there is a track uh, which, which dice results they can spend to make the shuttle progress. So you will spend the results to move from one star to another star, from a moon to another moon, from a moon to a star, from a star to a moon, a planet, everything, everything is possible. <laughs> And the only thing is that, yeah, every location has, um, let's say, a different possibilities to move on. Uh, from some places, you will have to spend results of one on the dice to move, or two, or three, or four. There is nothing more than four, that's the highest result. And there are, uh, there is another result, which is a flame. And a I, rocket. Yeah, ro rocket. Thank you. And I think there are two times the two uh, on each dice. So when you select what you are going to use, you put that dice aside, you will not use it for the next uh, dice toss, and you move your shuttle of the exact number of uh, slots that the dice symbols additioned indicated. For instance, if you select two, four dices, you will move eight spaces. And as I said, you put these two dice away, which means that you won't be able to use them for the next movements. That's where the uh, rocket symbols are very useful because they let you keep the dice for the next rolls. Every time you arrive on a planet, on a moon or a sun, but actually I think it's mostly planets and moons because 
cats burn on suns, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so every time you arrive on a slot where there is a planet or a moon, which means which is any spot, there is no empty spot. Um, you can ask first to the leader of the shuttle. Oh, is your cat going out? And then going down the shuttle. Is your cat going down? Is your cat going down? Etc. And so players in turn can decide if their cat is leaving the shuttle. If the cat is leaving the shuttle, they will just place the cat on the moon. Each moon can only store one cat because I don't know if these are big cats or small moons, but it's only room for one cat. And the planet, you can store as many cats as you want. So the player takes their uh, cat uh, token and puts it on the on the planet or moon. And then it goes in turn asking, yeah, do you want to leave the, the planet, etc, etc. And then it will continue tossing dice, going to the next location after having selected which dice to use for the movement, and then asking people if they want to stay. Or if they want to stay in the shuttle, that is. So of over time, you will end up with a very populated galaxy, uh, at the end of which there is a... I, I don't remember the exact name, but let's say it's a kind of black hole where you get back to the start, actually. Um, and or you can st you can store cats and get back to the start at the same time, so which makes you store other points differently. I've never reached that so far, so that's why my rules recollection of this is a little bit blurry. Yeah, you, you you must be really lucky to get to the end of the track. Yeah, it's very, very difficult. You must get lots of, lots, lots, lots of rockets on the dice. Um, and so, yeah, the, the cats have different um, abilities that you use, of course, if the said cat is in the shuttle. Some of them says, oh, if the shuttle explodes, that's when you cannot get dice that work. I'm still going out on the next... Uh, on the planet we were at, because else your cat stays. If the shuttle cannot move, the shuttle explodes and you keep your cat for the next shuttle, but then you are not putting your cat in space, which is making you on points. So this one can be very handy. Then some cats will make you start the travel earlier. Uh, earlier, more advanced already in the galaxy. Some of them will say, oh, if I go out, I take a dice out with me, which will, which will probably be problematic for all the friends, etc, uh, etc. Et so all players have the same uh, eight cats, and at the end, it's just a matter of counting points. Moons make so a few points, uh, planets, it's depending on how many uh, players, uh, on how many cats each player has, so the one with the most uh, cats on the planet gets a certain amount of points, the next ones get it, if there is an equality, an, egal an equality, 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 uh, equality, it's the first one to get that cat, Bros. <laughs> yeah, it's the lose, thank you. It's the first one that got the cat on the planet that gets the points. And then yes. there are a few special achievements, like putting four cats on four different planets or things like that, that get you a few extra points. And even the point uh, tokens are, in my opinion, very, very cute. Uh, because they are all like cat toys, uh, and the, the way they look, they, they are quite a few that are red and shiny, and they made me think a lot, I don't know why, but uh, of um, Lunar New Year, and all the Chinese festivals where you see the red envelopes, uh, and things like that. So, yeah, overall, it's a very simple game, to be honest. I hope to have my parents play it when they visit me in a few weeks. Um, yeah, I think as a push yellow game, it's very easy to, to grasp and understand. And it ends up being very fun uh, with your friends when you leave the shuttle and then they're like, Ah, oh, but I wanted to do this. And sorry, no. So... Yeah, I think that's all I personally have to say on this game. So Alexis played with us, and I think Alicia, you played as well. So what? Do you I think? love. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, okay. really enjoyed it. Yes, I thought that the partial luck mechanics were super fun to to play with. Yeah, uh, I can add a couple of thoughts, but uh, this is coming from someone who actually loves Knizia designs. And uh, well, uh, you have with Rainer Knizia, you used to have 
either a card game or a dice game. Dice games are the most cutthroat busters things you you you, you manage to play because uh, uh, Rainer Knizia subtly slides in mathematics in everything. He's a professor of mathematics and it shows. Yes, but here Be- it's done because cats. <laughs> yeah, because cats. Cats to cover. So uh, the, 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 the real, the beautiful thing about this game is, is that basically what Audrey said. So you can learn the game immediately and you can, uh, you can play it for fun and have fun uh, without worrying about anything else. Yeah. But if you want to plan, you can you can be nasty at this game. Uh, I mean, the 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 cat with the special power. Uh, basically, uh, I, I don't know it's if it's clear, but only the cats who landed on a planet uh, or a moon score points. So if the cats stay on the rocket when the rocket explodes, the cats are lost. And you make no points. Well, and you still have 10 shuttle tries to get points. Yeah. You have 8 cats, yeah. so hopefully you can... Yeah, yeah, oh, of course. But but the the fact is that you are pushing your luck because the more you move along the, the track, the less dice you have to move. And when you cannot move anymore, the, tra- the, the rocket is lost. So the powers of the cats are a beautiful choice because when you are playing with aggressive with, with an aggressive bunch of bastard players like i used to play you basically see the one oh so so you will live with the highest dice uh, uh, in the you will bring uh, when you live uh, for a planet you will live with one die uh, okay so you you want to make me so I, I need to land the first, but you are basically passively, aggressively making statements. When you start uh, uh, from, I think, 10 squares ahead, I don't remember, but what you, when you start the rocket uh, uh, advanced on the track, you are saying, say? okay, play, okay, players, let's cooperate to get the farthest possible. But I can think that you have already enough cats on planets, so I want to make your rocket explode. So basically I'll take the dice with me. And all the other players will take the cat with the paracute, we, we, which can land on a planet even if the rocket explodes. So that's it. You basically see everyone picking a cat and everyone counter picking and playing, and then you have dice which make a lot of compelling decisions. For instance, I am the captain, I can move with a six and with a rocket, but I really want that all my opponents fo- fail early. So I'll move with a six and I won't, will not use the rocket, for instance. The, the, there is a lot to do in this game, although everything is basically look based, and you have to push your luck to get far and win. The uh, other people you play with are mean. Yeah, yeah, of course. Even my kids are mean. Everyone is mean at my household. I, I think it's the your fault of the parents. Your kids are meaner than I Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course. Uh, I, I am teaching them competition. So <laughs> that's your fault. Yeah, what I, it's always the parents. Yeah. <laughs> what I really enjoy about the game is that there's also a good deal of strategy. It's not just blind luck. Sometimes you have to also think. Well, I could only use the this rocket that will get me, get me to the next step. The problem is that the next step only has small dice, and it's going to be a lot harder to use them. So I should rather use the uh lose a die but land onto a better spot for me that might allow me to use a better rocket or something like that there's like a a lot of little uh, decisions that you you have to take and always the option to land onto the nearest planet and leave the other player to maybe get a bigger score but also take a bigger risk uh thinking about all of that is very interesting especially since there's also the side objective so you have to uh also plan uh plan with that ahead um, I, I thought that it was a very 
a clean game, a very fun game to play. It is also a game that only uses icons, so you can easily play it with people that don't understand. Uh, yeah, it's language independent. Whichever, game, yeah. whichever language you, you have the game on. But you can easily bring friends that uh, maybe don't know the, the game's language. It's something that I always appreciate, especially since the uh, icons are mostly clear uh the cat's power need uh need explaining a bit but yeah other than that everything is uh rather straightforward yeah o also i i want to say another thing about this game uh you basically have uh, eight cats uh, with different powers and everyone has the same cats and they decide which cat to bring in the rocket every time this means that the game is perfectly symmetrical, yep. but you choose the powers you decide to use. And in the end, you you will end up with a combination of what you did and what your opponents counterpicked. It means you have complete knowledge of this. The game is fully symmetrical and yet it feels like an asymmetrical game. I think since asymmetrical games are, are, are so popular... Uh, Pulling a thing like this uh, is a thing that when you notice it is beautiful. I think it's a really smart design. Uh, <laughs> and on this note, I have to say that an another uh, simple Knizia game, which is a roll and write or a roll and divide game, which plays like this with dice, is another hit, is Marabunta. But uh, if there's interest, uh, we, uh, I'll talk about it because... Uh, Rainer Knizia does wonders with dice and does wonders wi with cars. I, I, I think, uh, truly, when when he scores the the good game, he, he made seven hundred of them, and uh, some are completely ugly. But uh, the memora the truly memorable ones are beautiful, beautiful games, and is Nick's maths everywhere. So yeah, I, I, I love uh, MLEM Space Agency. Yeah, I, I like it a lot, honestly. I wouldn't say I love it, but I like it a lot. Yeah, I, I actually love it uh, because it's a family game uh, which you can bring out basically anytime. Uh, you know, uh, to make a comparison... Uh, this game debuted the last Essen, I think. I I, I got it pre-ordered from Essen, so I have it uh, since late October, November of 2023. So it has been uh, six months, and I usually play a lot of different board games because I want to have something to talk about uh, on the podcast. So uh, I think it's a good thing to say that we still play MLAM, for instance, this Easter I played it with the family, so I think that this makes a game which is lovable. Of course, it it this will not be the game I'll be most passionate about ten years from now, but it's a game I think I could still play ten years from now. Yeah, it's a game you will have fun memories of. Yeah. With Mlem going up to the stars, let's go back to something a little bit more uh, earthian. Well, in this case, uh, set in the shattered land and talk a bit about the Seven Citadel. So this is the second game by Sirius Paul that follows the widely successful Seventh Continent. It reuses most of the game's mechanics, but setting the games into a more straightforward set of campaigns. Uh, cleaning up some of the issues from the first game. First of all, uh, the team is very different. Seven Citadel is set in a strange, weird fantasy-ish universe where gigantic monster worms have been destroying the country. A guild of necrodroids have been using their magic to keep them at bay through the use of a magical and dangerous flora. They live in big citadels, supposedly well defended, filled with people tasked with taking care of those planned, forced in a life of servitude as slave gardeners. You play as one of those sla uh, slave gardeners that, uh, well, the citadel gets attacked, you flee the citadel and then you explore the land and build a new citadel basically where you start to figure out what the worms are and how to defeat them and uh, figuring out a little bit more about the world. 
I didn't really resonate with the team too much. Uh, it's a bit of a high concept fantasy that didn't really manage to pull me in uh, when reading the text. Uh, about one word out of eight is some uh, fantasy gibberish that uh, I find a little bit grating, but it's not too big of an issue because I still managed to enjoy the story, even if I wasn't fully on board with the universe it is set in. Just like the first game, it is an exploration game. Uh, everything in the game uses those big square cards that can be the terrains, items, character, monster, anything really. Uh, you'll be putting them down to build the area you are exploring slowly, each card being a, either a new room or a new location. Uh, on those cards, you'll sometimes have skill checks or sometimes hidden numbers rewarding up seven players with items or new location to draw if you pick the cards with the right uh, hidden numbers. Everything in the game uses the same uh, systems of skill check, telling the player to draw a certain number of stamina cards. Those cards have stars on them. You compare the number of stars you drew with the skill checks requirements to see if you passed it, then you deal with the consequences. Um, oh yeah, and uh, in the this game they also added a uh, kind of a tiered skill check where you have to do the same skill check multiple times and slowly wear it down to simulate combat or more difficult uh, tests. Sometimes you'll get the option to keep a card in hand as some of them have useful abilities that will allow you to succeed other tests. Another thing that they added in the game, in the, this game is a set of uh, classes basically where some character or some items resonate with uh, some class and some of your stamina cards will have different action, different um, uh, class icons. So for example, uh, you might have, I don't know, some uh, stealthy gear, like a, a cape that allows you to blend better. Uh, and if you draw a card that has the stealth icon, then you can get like an extra star for it, for example. Stuff like that makes the uh, skill checks and uh, especially the um, each player will have a slightly different role within the story and within the, the, the checks and you can feel like you're fulfilling different roles. You can have a character that is better suited for combat, another character who you know is going to be better at athletics checks. Uh, this is quite interesting and adds a lot of variation to the game. Uh, it's something that I quite enjoyed. Um, if you ever ran out of cards, you can spend elf points to refill your deck. The first game had an emphasis on survival, forcing you to sometimes grind some location where you could find food to keep your deck full. It was widely seen as frustrating. Oh, yes. A lot of, <laughs> a lot of play players had problem with that. Um, and the way that they changed it to spending health point is a lot more interesting because you start with usually enough to, to explore quite a bit. Um, it also allows you to mitigate that uh, more easily. There's more option to refill your, your health points. And it feels like you always have the right amount of uh, health points to explore the area that you need to get to the objective. But exploring uh, side places or taking on diff uh, difficult challenges is going to require you to find some way to heal yourself, for example. Um, speaking of, uh, another big change into the game uh, is that you will explore the Shattered Lands in multiple campaigns, broken down into chapters, giving you a general objective and a direction to go, uh, then setting you free into a somewhat open world that will evolve through the story as you explore it. Uh, usually you'll go into a sort of exploration with a, an objective in mind and then go back to you do your main base uh, once you figured things out. But the game is, the game never feels aimless and you always know where you're going and it feels like it builds on what you've done, uh, which was one of the problems of the Seventh Continent where uh, the objectives were sometimes a bit hard to understand what they wanted of it, out of you and it felt like you were exploring the same location again and again in the different, uh, I guess, story threads that the game had. There's also quite a lot of story and dialogue in these games compared to the previous one, uh, referring you to a dialogue book that feels uh, a bit like a choose-your-own-adventure uh, in dialogue form. 
they take full advantage of the book to give you a bit more meat to your adventures in describing the world a little bit more, fleshing out characters. Uh, on top of that, whenever you head back to your base, you have a little bit of base building using resources that you'll find while exploring. You can unlock buildings that will give you more stamina cards or new abilities or change certain areas of the map or introduce new quests. Overall, uh, I think this is a straight improvement for the first game. It is. It still has a few issues, but the simple joy of exploration is extremely well rendered and I've been enjoying my time with it tremendously. Um, I think that if anyone was interested in Seventh Continent but didn't jump into it so far, uh, I think that going with the Seventh Citadel is the better choice uh, unless you really prefer the team of one over the other. Uh, I know that uh, Alessio, you've uh, you've played the game, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> I, I I I'm finishing the Final Throne, so Ooh, yeah, yeah. Basically, I didn't play with uh, with the uh, other difficulty with uh, uh, I don't repeat, something like Peril something uh, the expansion with the divider at one hundred and thirty uh, one hundred and thirty. Without the difficulty, uh, I didn't play with that. I played just uh, regular difficulty with all expansions. And, well, I basically agree on everything you said, except a couple of things. Uh, I think that uh, the design of this game is a complete improvement over the Seventh Continent. But... I think that actually uh, the improvement uh, it's uh, they of course listen to the to the complaints of the people especially in the serious pulp uh, forums because basically everything they said has been addressed and uh, and actually implemented in uh, Seven Citadel but in Seven Continent you basically uh, were playing like this uh, I have a card, I have to look everything in this card, let's check each word in the card, let's see if, if any clue I have matches the card, because if I move the wrong direction, I'll die, I'll starve into, uh, into tiles most. And uh, you will basically... Uh, Seven Continent was a full sandbox, completely sandbox with uh, perfect riddles and uh, perfect exploration but a counted number of steps and uh, you were basically trying to optimize and be extremely efficient and try to plan the route in a way where you could get every you, you could get to survive basically survive was the key uh, and it was basically a solo game. Seven Citadel is actually is pretty enjoyable in uh, multiple players. I think I, I played it two players. I played solo and I played it f with a full four people party, and it was enjoyable at that player counts. Uh, the fact that it's not needed that uh, you get actions in order or in a strict round uh, in a strict. Round Robin is uh, perfect, fits the game perfectly, and the game goes on and on, and you can have a full party of adventurers. I, I like a lot of the magic users because they have the most varied uh, sets of powers, although at a big card cost. But uh, Seven Citadel is not like that. It's not a sandbox. Uh, like you said, you always know what you need to do and you have plenty of HP to to basically complete it. So it's a bit of railroaded. Uh, uh, I don't know. They, they expanded a lot. It, it is a straight up improvement because they, they add the two dimensions to everything. You have two dimensions to the car play because now you have class icons and if you have class powers, you get them. They are. You have two two dimensions to exploration because there's the world map, and you have to increase the world map because when you update the map, you learn about new stuff. You get dialogues which are key, and you get uh, 
uh, objectives and stuff because you know stuff and you can change the, the the ending of the story because you you explored more on the on the macroscopic macroscopic level but you still have to do the microscopic level or, by exploring that that is a bit limited because basically uh, there are a lot of exceptions, uh, starting from scenario two of a, a, a every threat of every campaign you play, but you basically follow the path you it's that's railroaded to you because except to to one hundred percent complete stuff, you uh, one thing that uh, must be explained is that uh, you have a thing which is called the ground shiver, which has a level, and uh, you can move uh, spending uh, with, with an economic cost, with a cheap cost, only to cards which match or are lower than your ground shiver level. So that there are uh, there are tiles where you will not move voluntarily because they would cost a lot to move to, except if you know that you really, really need to go there because you have a clue which leads there. That means that the progression of the adventure is actually pretty straightforward. And if you come from seven continent where you are used to optimize the heck of everything you do, uh, I, I think it's easy. I think the game was rather was rather easy. At, at least so far, I, I, um, I, I remember that the, there was this compound action, the, the one Alexis were, was referencing, which is a multi-stage action, uh, where at some point you, you had to save a drowning man. If you uh, failed at every step, so if you didn't bring the, the, the correct number of successes, you, the man would just drown and uh, you would lose the dialogue, basically. Uh, so you had to save him. And uh, I, I just remember that uh, I, I could afford to waste a lot of cards to just be sure to get a success by playing the right cards and enhancing my opportunities with gear and stuff. But basically, drawing six or seven cards to just get three successes on a chain was perfectly fine to me, because I had enough life points, enough stuff to do that. And I, I remember to distinctly think that uh, in Seven Continent I will never, I will never have tried that because that, that action would be a trap. Spending yeah. so much effort, I, I, I will never do that in Seven Continents. So the, the game that, feels a lot more fair, a lot more focused onto the exploration. It's not uh, the Seventh Continent sometimes had this really ruthless, uh, grind, yeah. slow feeling to it. And sometimes there was a little bit of disconnect because you were exploring this kind of fantastic uh, Jill Vernesian uh, island where you had all of those mysteries that you wanted to uncover. But uh, what was happening in the game is that your character was starving and basically resorting to eat sand while slowly uh, dying of thirst. Oh, yeah, thirst. exactly. It's, in this game, it feels a lot more fair. It feels like you have a lot more options to, to move around, to do your stuff. And oftentimes, the worst thing that is going to happen is not that you're going to uh, die. It's that uh, you're going to progress the scenario into the wrong way. Something bad is going to happen and you are going to be moved onto a bad uh, part of the story, which is perfectly fine. Uh, I think that works better for the game because what I want the, this game to be is to be about exploration, is to be about discoveries, to be about the fun of uh, trying to figure out which item to use and getting the right items to do what I wanted to do. I really enjoyed that and I thought that the game works well on that end. But yeah, you shouldn't get into this game thinking that it is as... Uh, challenging as the seven yeah, continent. Yeah, exactly. I, I actually um, I don't know what to say because uh, we talked about uh, ISS Vanguard earlier and ISS Vanguard was a game with a 
beautiful story with a beautiful campaign uh, n- better game mechanics than the ones in Tainted Grail and uh, a, a very satisfying way of playing dice and equipment and stuff but the game was uh, uh, had a bit of uh, oh, it was a bit over designed in uh, some aspects it uh, had a bit of flows, especially at lower player counts. If you didn't fill your hands, so it began. It can become uh, a, li- a bit of a grind with a sing- with a solo player. But if you're playing for people, maybe uh, you have a lot to read, and so the game gets slow because everyone needs to listen to one people, re- one person reading. So this is, uh, in some ways, the op- the opposite of ISS Vanguard, because the mechanics is beautifully simple. I love the seventh game's mechanic, because you can explain it basically in five minutes, and everyone is able to play immediately, and uh, the setup is f- extremely fast, the teardown is extremely fast, the game is beautifully played at any time with any player count. Uh, but, yes? No, I mean, uh, from my experience of Seventh Continent, that is, that is true. And yeah, I, di- I did hesitate to, to get Seventh Citadel. And I mean, since my, let's say, hot favorite uh, campaign game is uh, and ended up being a Huntress Pass, I'm like glad I did not end up with another <laughs> game on my shelves that I would regret buying. Uh, just because, I mean, there's have. 24 hours and I can't invent more time so <laughs> yeah yeah exactly that the, the, this game is beautifully simple it plays perfectly and railroads you through a story with a bit of exploration and you have leeway to explore a few side quests which are necessarily simple because if you spend too much energy on those you will risk to fail too much but each scenario like Alexis said has a fail forward mechanism so if you return before completing all objectives there's no big deal you'll just go to the next chapter with the different with different bits of story in the, co- in the ending of the previous chapter and maybe different initial conditions and the booklets of the threads are beautifully made and the story flows perfectly and I like a lot the fact that this game is, uh, except for the prologue, uh, it's uprising, it's uplifting. I I mean, uh, you are improving your situation constantly. (laughs) You you face threats, but there's no despair. Uh, The the theme of the game is hope, actually. So... uh, that's beautiful, and I liked it a lot. The, the only problem I see with this is I don't know. I I don't know if I will replay all threats as many times I played. I replayed the cards in Seven Continent. I mean, uh, I, for instance, Dada Shame uh, Awakening. I don't see any reason. I, I'm happy with the ending I got. I don't see any reason to replay it immediately, except for showing it to a friend, for instance. Uh, on the other end, I would play the, the Voracious Goddess again every time in the Seven Continent. Maybe not the Voracious Goddess because it's the first curse, but I will definitely uh, play the Balloon One, for instance. So, uh, this is it. Uh, there are pros and cons. Of course, it's a different game and it feels different while sharing the same mechanics. And I think it's a beautiful effort. Uh, I would like to have seen it developed a bit more, but I had a lot of fun enjoying it. Uh, too bad there are just three threats, but there will be an expansion, right? Uh, yes, I do not have uh, any of the expansions, unfortunately. I decided to pick the straight uh, first option so that later I would be uh, I would just buy them because I um, I wasn't certain at a hundred percent that I would enjoy the game, and especially none of the expansion looked too interesting to me. So I decided to only get the the base game. 
Okay, so uh, I have just to spoil this little thing which has no story connotations, which is if you get the expansion, I think it's knowledge is power, uh, you get uh, these booklets which are basically uh, exploration cards, uh, which are two cards uh, folded together like a book and they are books narrating stuff yeah they, they are good also because they give you more clues and hints that you can actually use uh, in game in some points like if you know how this is done then you can pick this and uh, when you get to them uh, you smile and it's beautiful that they are also found in the libraries there are libraries in the game and uh, well as usual, the game is the, the the design of the game is mechanically tight and waterproof. I think it's beautiful. Everything fits perfectly. The way uh, the mechanism they created in uh, Seven Continent in Seven Citadel is perfect. The way of using class uh, of using scenario icons to change the what's happening on a determinate place at the determinate time is perfect it's perfect i think uh, some of the of the of the ideas they had here are pure genius and show full maturity of the concepts they developed and uh, well uh, i have a lot of praise so actually of how about how they designed it too uh, really too bad it's a bit too railroaded in certain parts but ex aside for for that it's beautiful uh, oh, oh also uh, another thing uh, because it was pitched with a mechanism on gear which was beautiful but it was simplified uh, basically now you can use gear as long as it has a unique keyword meaning that you can have uh, one armor item for instance or stuff like that one shield or one weapon or something uh, i think there is not two ended anymore uh, i don't remember actually uh, but uh, the original mechanic for that was uh, i think was even smarter uh, every item had a set of keywords and you could uh, only have three of the same keywords I keep at a time so that for instance ex especially cumbersome weapons just add weapon weapon as keywords and you could carry less of the others and that was very, very smart in my opinion but I think it was thought complex to keep track of so yeah that's, yeah. <laughs> that's definitely what, uh, what I thought when playing the the demo that they had uh this seemed like something that would be easy to uh not realize that you you pick the same uh, keyboard multiple times yeah and just a little bit more just a little bit too cumbersome uh i i think that especially for a game like this the simplification is uh is a good idea no that the, they always uh, simplifying is always the way to go uh I, I am a bit of sad because this is a lost. Uh, uh, it lost a bit of expression. Uh, it, it, the, the 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 previous mechanism was uh, telling you more without telling it was showing more. But uh, fair, fair, fair. It's fair. Uh, actually, they, they it was a sensible call. So no regrets about that. So in June there will be a print uh, crowdfunding with uh, new expansions and new threats yeah and uh, yeah. i i might join in for the new expansions we'll see uh what they are it kind of depends on the uh the the theming since i'm a bit less interested in the this month's teams but we'll see <laughs> um, yeah. yeah that is a seventh citadel and it's a straight upgrade from uh seventh continent so big uh <laughs> big recommendation for me yeah, I, I recommend it too. Uh, just uh, be be aware of what you buy because, of course, uh, there are differences. So, I think we we did a decent job of highlighting them. So, yeah. So that's all the time that we have for this episode. But you can catch us over at patreoncom slash or at uh, well, no, we do not have a, an 
Twitter account anymore. Well, so. we have it, but we don't post. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, until next, next time, we have been the last ND. So it's going to be a uh, goodbye from Alessio. Bye bye. Uh, goodbye from uh, Audrey. Bye. And from myself. But remember that the second E in Standy is for... Explore. Build. I, I'm pretty sure that we've done exploration before. Oh, you yeah, are the hero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right.